You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 269. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey, veggie lovers. I hope that you're having a very plantastic day and welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. So today I have Jackie Ackerberg, who is a recipe creator, food lover, and photographer behind the popular plant-based food blog, Jack Fruitful Kitchen, and Instagram account at Jack Fruitful Kitchen, as well as author of the newly published book, The Clean Vegan Cookbook. So it was such a pleasure to talk with Jackie today, learn about her story, how she transitioned to a vegan plant-based diet a few years ago, things that she's learned in the journey, how it's influenced her friends and family. We talk about her journey into becoming a food blogger and her cookbook and why she wrote the cookbook and some of her favorite recipes. We also talk about her love of kale and what makes kale so delicious, the secret she has, which shouldn't be a secret and it won't be a secret after you listen to this episode. So it was a fantastic episode, and I think that there's definitely some tips for all of us in this episode, some good reminders about food prepping, but also some mindset stuff. So I really hope that you enjoy this episode. Thank you if you're a new listener, welcome. I hope you love what you see here and you continue to listen to episodes. And if you're a long-term listener, I appreciate you. Welcome back. And now let's welcome Jackie Ackerberg. Jackie Ackerberg, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited to talk all about your journey and your cookbook, but let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your vegan plant-based journey. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, So I have been vegan, fully vegan for about four years. Um, Prior to that, I was, I would say 90% plant-based. Growing up, I was, I kind of ate a diverse diet, but always found that foods like dairy did not sit well with me. Whenever I ate meat, which I did not enjoy, I was left feeling very bloated, tired, fatigued, inflamed. Um, And then I did find that I could kind of eat eggs and some seafood without any direct impact, but I was just experiencing, even once I cut out the dairy and the meat, I was still experiencing a decent amount of allergies, asthma, um, tons of breakouts, inflammation, and just really wanted to get to the bottom of it. I mean, none of these issues were preventing me from living a happy life, but I certainly didn't feel my best, didn't look my best, and just was frustrated waking up every single day and having more breakouts or more digestive issues. That was one of my biggest things or having allergies year round. I just really wanted to get to the bottom of it. So, um, I'd actually watched a couple documentaries about plant-based eating, decided to give it a try for 30 days, ended up sticking with it. And not only did I love what I was eating and enjoying the taste of the food, but I also, um, I just felt so much better. And I was one of those people where from a very young age, and I live in Iowa, so we have pretty high pollen, pretty a lot of different um, environmental allergens. But I was someone that had to take allergy medication even in January when it's negative 20 out. There should really be nothing that I'm having an environmental reaction to. Um, and all of that went away. My asthma went away. 
my breakouts stopped. My digestion became incredibly regular and just consistent, pain-free, no issues. Um, and that is kind of where it all began, is realizing that I could look and feel the best version of myself. Wow, that's incredible. And I think what you were trying to get at is, yeah, you didn't have any life-threatening allergies. You, you didn't have a chronic, you know, life-threatening condition, but you didn't have the right. well-being that you wanted. You weren't feeling the best and you wanted to feel the best because we all want to feel our best to enjoy life and to embrace life. And I think it's incredible that so many people, they assume some of their kind of allergic symptoms are due to inhalants, you know, the environmental mm -hmm. allergies and have no clue that it could be in the food. And it's hard <laughs> to tell sometimes, right? Because there's these things that we have been told our whole lives, oh, that's a health food. It's good for you. You're supposed to eat yeah. it. it. It's not going to be bad for you. Like, you know, and so you're eating it all the time around the clock. So there's no way to tell the difference because it's always in your system, right? So it's not until yeah. you get it out of your system, then you're like, oh, <laughs> now I see, you know? So right. it takes that, it takes making that step and really going all the way sometimes to see the difference. I completely agree. And I, like you mentioned, I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't have a chronic illness that I was fighting. It was just these, I'm looking at myself, I'm like, hey, I'm overall pretty healthy. I live a really balanced life. I'm eating a clean diet. Like what's going on? Um, and yeah, it was going kind of cold turkey on, you know, pun not intended, but on all of those items to just realize that you really can feel better when you cut out the junk. So this was four years ago. Tell mm -hmm. me what's been the most surprising part of your vegan transition and what's been the hardest or most frustrating part? Those are both great questions. And I think, um, I, I'll be straight with you. I actually had an easier transition than most people because as I'm, I don't know if I, mentioned this before that clearly, but growing up, I never liked the taste of meat. Like I'm not one of the, even living in the middle of the Midwest in pork and beef country, like I never enjoyed meat. My dad, despite his efforts, he was always making a different hamburger or a different steak or taking me to his favorite tenderloin place and being like, this is the one that you're going to love. And I just <laughs> never did. So cutting that out was pretty much a no brainer for me. Um, but I did really love and I loved eggs and salmon and cheese was kind of my treat like I knew that if I ate it I wasn't going to feel great my digestion was going to be messed up for about a week and I was going to have some breakouts but it was one of those things where you know if I was having a bunch of friends over I'd build a big charcuterie board and um, I kind of craved that like a really good sharp cheddar or goat cheese and realizing that once you cut that out I mean, it's addictive. Like people joke about cheese being more addicting than heroin or crack or something like that, but it's true. Like I was, I would crave that salty fat filled dairy, but after I cut it out, after about 60 days of being vegan, um, it was very surprising to me to find that I no longer craved it and it actually no longer tasted good. Like, I don't know if you experienced this as a child, but I remember the very first time my parents let me try like fancy cheese. Like it was, I think it was a really sharp cheddar or one of those funky, maybe a gorgonzola or something. And it doesn't naturally taste good to you. You're kind of like, this is, this tastes bad, but your body adapts, your body learns to love it. And you start having an addictive craving for that because of the levels of fat and sugar and salt and animal products. Um, so it was really surprising to me to to see that about 60 days into my plant-based journey, I actually had my book club over. We, were, we got pizza from a local spot here. I got a vegan pizza and then a few, few regular pizzas for them. And one of them was like my, the holy grail. If I was ever gonna eat pizza, it was the one I craved. And I'm like, I'm just gonna try a bite. It's been 60 days, cheese-free. I had to spit it out. Like I did not even enjoy the taste anymore. Um, wow. So that detox, that was, that was really surprising to me that to see that what your body likes and what your body craves is a learned behavior um, based on what you put into it. And that was pretty cool. 
Yeah, what a what a cool story. And it's really interesting because the brain has this immense capacity to neural adapt mm -hmm. in both directions is what you're saying, right? So the good news is we can neural adapt when we make changes in a health promoting direction. It just takes a, a few days to a few weeks depending on your level and you're like, "Oh yeah, this tastes great now. I I don't yeah. need I'm not craving that same level of whatever hyperpalatability that I was." But what I also teach parents over and over and over again is that pretty much any flavor is acquired. So that can go both ways. Like you're saying, we can unfortunately acquire the taste for alcohol. That is yeah. most definitely an acquired taste. That is such a strong, when you, you take it and it tastes like poison, right? But people yeah. obviously acquire the taste for that and they love it. Same thing for all of these fermented foods. Because your body initially is like, ugh, that's rotten. I don't want that. But you acquire the taste over time. You just think of some of these countries where they eat like fermented fish. It's like part of their culture oh. and everybody <laughs> loves it, you know? So yeah. um, you, you neuro adapt in both ways. But I think as an adult, we have that ability to be more mindful about it and to have more insight about it. And I agree that I was never a cheese person because it I do not like sour, fermenty things. I've had to acquire yeah. the taste for like the health promoting things like, um, you know, the sauerkraut and things like that. So now I like a little bit, but it's not like my I don't crave it. Like it's not my preference. Mm -hmm. Like I really want some of that sour stuff. So that was that cheese part was not a problem for me, but I was basically a baby cow like I loved milk with everything like I would drink <laughs> milk with everything. And um, so that one took about two weeks. But now, if you know, like you go to a restaurant and you go somewhere and you accidentally have some dairy or butter or something like that, I know right away because you it can feel it smells and it tastes like body odor. It's yes. musty. Like it smells like it came from a mammary gland. Like and yes. it stays on your face. And you can smell it the rest of the day. I have to go wash my face. Like, ooh, that, that had butter in it. That had dairy in it. Mm -hmm. And whenever we were eating it day after day, meal after meal, you had no clue. Like, you had no clue that you had you know, all that stuff on you. But now I can tell right away. So, yeah, it's incredible what happens to your taste buds and your sense of smell when you've been off of certain things for a while. Yeah, that is truly fascinating and I could not agree with you more. When I dine out, I typically try to be pretty low maintenance as far I'm I don't gr drill the server about if the soup I'm ordering has a tablespoon of butter or something like that. I try to just go with the flow and choose the best possible option. BPO, that's what I tell people that ask me for advice when they're dining out or, or with friends. It's like, just navigate it the best you can. When you're in control, when you're in your own kitchen, you can be 100% plant-based, 100% clean. But when you're out, just do the best you can. But it's, like you said, it's a it's a feeling, it's an odor. The second you take your bite, like, oh, yeah, that's in there. They're just gonna nod and smile and <laughs> drink lots of water. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so fascinating. Well, tell me, how has your transition influenced your friends and your family? Yeah, that's, um, I did have one question for you really quick about what we were discussing with what we naturally enjoy, like how you didn't like cheese, and but you uh -huh. loved milk. Real quick, how much of that do you, believe or feel that is um, nature versus nurture as far as a lot of it's a learned or an acquired taste, but you just didn't like cheese and I just don't like meat. Is that where yeah. we're born that way or? I think, I think there is a significant genetic component to it. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever had your genes analyzed, uh, mm -hmm. your those DNA tests and stuff, but oh, I know ans that like ancestry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm a super taster. So I don't like bitter flavors. I don't like, you know, strong sour flavors. Like I was never the kid that liked like the sour candy or any of that kind of stuff because it's too intense for me. Like it's too much. Although what's interesting with the with the research is that show that super tasters go one extreme or the other. They either don't like those things or they have to have those things, which is interesting. But I'm yeah. I'm the kind that I don't want to have super bitter, you know, super sour things, but I've acquired the taste for some things. Like bitter greens and things like that. I love it yeah. now where when I was younger, I didn't as much because I've deliberately acquired the taste. But whatever you were talking about your your issue with meat, that's actually quite common. It's more common than people think. 
because it's a concern that parents come to me all the time. So meat, just like anything else, is acquired as a flavor. And little kids, infants, and toddlers naturally do not usually gravitate towards meat. Why do you think that kids' number one item to eat in the United States is chicken nuggets? It's because it's not like meat. It's a meat-like substance that has been breaded and fried and parents feel good because they're like, oh, thank God they're getting enough protein because parents are so it. concerned about yeah. protein. So kids don't just, you know, once they get their teeth and they're ready to wean, they don't want to just bite into a right. steak. That's not, that's not very typical. And a lot of the children, they have to acquire that flavor by parents kind of pushing them towards it. Hey, yeah. have that, have a bite of this, have this, have a bite of that. And eventually they get it. But um, I do think that there's genetic differences in some mm -hmm. of the preferences, but in general, all things can be acquired. You know, like you yeah. just have to be deliberate enough about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's so interesting about the chicken nuggets, because that was like one of the few things, one of the few chicken things I would eat as a kid. And then as an adult trying, you know, thinking I needed that protein from animal-based sources and I was realizing I'm like okay I'm only eating chicken or beef or all of these animal-based products if they're so seasoned or so covered in a sauce that I actually can't even taste what they are that I'm just it's a carrier for horseradish sauce or a spicy sweet and spicy marinade like that's the only way that I'm eating it this is not what my body wants this is not sitting well with me and that's um that was kind of one of the biggest indicators for me along with how I felt, but. Yeah, well, it sounds like you gave it a, a, a good old college try <laughs> for a yeah. long time. <laughs> you were like, nope, nope, I'm, I'm much happier without it. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's go back to friends and family. What um, thoughts do you have there about how your transition has influenced them? Yes, so as far as my friends and family, it's been, um, it's been really good. Honestly, I have a very supportive circle. Um, as far as my family goes, I have the one side who's pretty traditional, like Iowa farm people. Like they, there's no way they are ever going to go vegan, but they are super supportive, very open-minded. Um, they will, you know, at Thanksgiving every year, I always bring a couple of vegan dishes, help my mom make things and I make them vegan. And they will eat them and they will compliment them and be like, wow, and there's not even any butter or this is made of tofu or cashews or whatever it is. And they, they really enjoy it. And it's really eye-opening for them to see how they can enjoy foods. But I know that they are never going to change their ways. Many of them are, you know, over 70 and they're like, at this point, this is what I know. This is what I'm built of. That I'm not going to change now. Um, and then I have my other side of the family my husband, part of his family is incredibly supportive, has leaned in even more so to the plant-based lifestyle because of it. And then, you know, you have a couple people that are not that supportive and kind of jab you and uh, make the vegan comments, say they'll never eat it, say that you, you have kind of a whole mix. But I would say across the board, um, especially in my friend group, the number of my friends who are now eating plant-based at least a few times a week or entirely has been huge. And just in my, you know, extended circle from there, some of the people that have gone fully vegan since learning how I'm living my life, um, whether it's been weight loss or health changes or just overall a new love of food, it has been a pretty incredible impact um, on my circle. That's awesome. And it's a ripple effect. So you'll see over time that that ripple just extends further and further. And I will say something that's probably unexpected based upon my experience because I have seen this happen over and over and over again. What's ironic is that some of the people that are most vocal against your way of eating <laughs> end up being the ones who completely switch over to veganism in a really? few years. <laughs> yeah, and I think the reason is is because they have such strong cognitive dissonance yeah. that they it's almost like they're pushing against that, but there's some part of their brain that's saying, yeah, that might be for you, but they're pushing against it. So they almost like they have to push hard against it. But then mm -hmm. once they come around to it, they end up being like the diehard vegans, which is really strange and unexpected. So 
I think yeah. it's all about and then patience. they're probably <laughs> yeah and then just about setting an example and being joyful yeah. and happy and being available when people have the questions or are curious you know right um, but and that's such a, a good whole point evolution. as well yeah I found that especially because my husband and I were discussing this the other day I was with a group of people and there was one very vocal person um and it's just like it's confusing to me it's like what I'm doing is not negatively impacting you I'm not even talking about it and if anything you should be grateful that you know, one of us is eating less meat and having a positive impact on the planet and not attacking you for it. But the fact that they're so vocal, and I, I think it typically comes from a place of um, lack of information or fear or insecurity about maybe they do realize the amount of animal cruelty or the impact on our planet or the health implications that they're kind of supporting based on their choices, but they are too scared to change. They don't know how to change or they don't have a circle or support system that allows them to easily make a change with their diet um, and therefore they kind of lash out or poke fun or make sarcastic comments almost as a, a layer of defense and to feel normal uh, around someone that's doing things differently and for that it's just like I try to just be supportive like you said and open and happy and very open to honest discussion only when people want to because um, it's easy as someone that lives a plant-based life to want to share how excited you are about the positive impact on yourself, on planets, and on animals, uh, on our planet, I guess I should say. But it's typically not well received. Yeah, especially when it's made you feel so good. Like I have yeah. a hard time not sharing things that make me feel good because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people want to feel good, so I want to share that information. So it can be hard at the beginning, especially when you're really passionate, but I totally yeah. get that. All right, well, let's talk about your cookbook which I need to grab it. Well, why don't you start talking about here it is. Yes, my book. It was already it's... on my shelf. The Clean okay. Vegan Cookbook. Oh my God, these recipes look amazing. I haven't had time to try one yet, but why did you write this cookbook? I am so excited about my book and thank you so much. I was thrilled to send you a copy and I cannot wait to hear what you make first. Um, I wrote this book for a couple of reasons. First of all, I feel like the vegan diet can be, for especially for new people, kind of confusing to navigate, especially nowadays with vegan diets and plant-based eating gaining uh, more popularity. There is so much processed food out there. And I think, you know, 20 years ago even, going vegan, you were automatically healthy, people thought. And I think people still think that today, like, oh, you're vegan, you must be so healthy, or oh, you're vegan, that's why you're thin. And it's like, no, I'm vegan because I nourish my body with whole plant-based foods. That was kind of my biggest passion because a lot of that processed food and those filler ingredients and preservatives, um, they don't do anything positive for your body. But without them, people sometimes don't know how to make food taste good. They don't know how to get the savory umami, um, different flavors and sensations they want in their mouth. So I wanted to create a whole book of recipes that are just as satisfying and just as delicious as maybe plant or maybe animal-based um, recipes would be, but with only whole ingredients that are truly going. I love it. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there are so many recipes in here that look incredibly mouthwatering. I love breakfast, so I love the breakfast section and having like this eggless quiche. Oh my gosh, amazing. So, uh, so yummy. All right, so tell me, what do you mean by clean eating? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And whenever you are focusing on whole foods, one of the advantages of whole foods is the fiber. So yeah. that you can have these delicious meals that feel satisfying that you don't have to eat like these, you know, keep eating because you actually don't feel satisfied, you know, yeah. um, when it's just a bunch of fat and not as much fiber and, you know, all of those hearty ingredients in there. So I really enjoy eating whole foods, mostly because I like to feel nice and full and satisfied, mm -hmm. but not icky or weighed down, you know, like if right. you overeat ultra processed foods, you might feel satisfied on one in one way, but then you also feel just like, oh, like you have to go take a nap in order to right. divert all your energy for your body to digest all of that. So it does have its disadvantages. Yeah. Why do you think people struggle so much with cooking delicious and nutritious meals? What are some of the obstacles that you see? I think a lot of it is our environment. Um, it's as far as the world we live in and society and what has become normal and what has been serve to us in, in the hyper palatization that you were talking about it's what we've gotten used to like more sh more fat more sugar more salt that's what restaurants do that's what food companies do they want us to be addicted to those things so i think part of it is that um i also think especially with you know sad or the standard american diet it's it's just we've been fed so many process we were addicted to those flavors and when you're looking at, um, if you're a family that typically eats, let's say a pork chop, a baked potato with butter and cheese and broccoli tossed in butter, and you're trying to then convert that to a plant-based diet, you might not know what to look for, for your main core protein source on a plate of just, you know, a carb, a protein and a fat uh, or a vegetable. So I think that can be challenging for people when they aren't willing to look outside the box or try new things. Or if they have a couple few kids and a busy lifestyle and a demanding job um, or a you know picky husband or partner, whoever that is, that wants fried chicken and cheesy potatoes, it's, and you're juggling your busy lifestyle, it can be hard. You don't want to make two or three different meals every single night for one for your kids that they'll eat, one for your husband and then a healthy one for yourself like that. And not to be you know sexist or gender roles at all but that i think oftentimes is what i hear from my followers and friends that um is their biggest challenge mm -hmm. yeah it's hard and especially just seeing how our lifestyle is that we seek a lot of pleasure from our food and i'm not saying that we mm -hmm. shouldn't have pleasure in our food because food is inherently pleasurable which is why we eat otherwise we yeah. get in big trouble as a species but um, knowing from my own personal experience is whenever you get into that cycle where food is like your only pleasure, you can get stuck on, okay, my meals have to be these hyper palatable things. Otherwise, I'm not going to have any joy in my life. And I mm -hmm. see that a lot too. And especially for children that they can develop these habits pretty young and pretty early of needing these hyper palatable foods all the time. Um, so that's, that can definitely be a barrier as well. So what are some of the tips that you give when people reach out to you and say, I, I'm struggling, I'm having to make three meals, how can I make this work? I don't know if I'm gonna be able to stay vegan. Absolutely. I think a big thing is um, that I always share with people is looking to more ethnic and diverse dishes. Mm -hmm. If you look past the standard American plate, and you look, I mean, even Mexican food, you can do veggie fajitas and black beans so easily. Guacamole. Um, if you look to Italian food, so one, one recipe in my book, it's, um, I think it's on page, let's see. Uh, 27, the super greens goddess pasta right here. Yum. So this is one that I oftentimes recommend because it has a whole bunch of kale, two cups of spinach, and raw cashews in the sauce. It tastes like Alfredo, but you're getting whole servings of vegetables, tons of nutritious ingredients. And, you know, pasta is vegan. I mean, unless you're using an egg-based noodle, but you can choose a pasta, even if you do a grain-free pasta or a lentil-based pasta or a whole wheat pasta, whatever fits into your diet and nutrition needs, um, sneaking in those veggies with recipes like that uh, is a great way. And you, it's not like you want to fool your family or sneak them, 
but they're going to love it and they're going to start enjoying recipes that have more veggies um, and asking for them and craving them and then you can kind of slowly incorporate more um, curries Asian food Indian food all of those are so easy to make clean and plant-based so encouraging people to try some of those different culture um, based recipes and just starting small if you shift your if you go from eating you know scrambled eggs and bacon for breakfast a turkey sandwich for lunch and fried chicken for dinner and vanilla ice cream for dessert to taking your whole menu vegan for your entire meat loving family it's going to be a shock you might not be drinking enough water so the fiber overload could be a little bit jarring and it can just it can just not go over super well um, so i typically recommend people have an open mind maybe if they're really meat forward right now take it slowly um, and look for recipes that are just a slight shift from what your family already enjoys yeah that's great advice and i agree i feel like when i first went plant-based vegan it was the same thing of like okay this american concept of your quote protein your meat your starch and your veggie which i'm wondering if that all originated from you know the food pyramid and what we've mm -hmm. been taught in this country like you have to have your protein uh you you know you can definitely veganize that and make it plant-based but ultimately i think the longer you're plant-based you end up going towards what flavor profiles you crave so yep. you're right whenever i ask my family if we're going out to eat uh what what are y'all craving you want mediterranean you want mexican you want thai you know it's like a flavor profile not a type of meat which in our yeah. meals it's centered around what meat are we going to start with then we kind of arrange everything else around that so it is a paradigm shift it's a different way to think about it but ultimately i think it's a more satisfying and more abundant way to think about meals you know because Absolutely. it's really restricted to just form all your meals around like three or four different kinds of meat you know <laughs> I tell people that all the time when they're like, so what do you possibly eat as a vegan? I'm like, okay, you eat like four different animals. I eat like a thousand different vegetables. <laughs> like, let's talk about this. The, the typical American diet, you, you're literally rotating three or four different animals, three different, four different types of meat, but there's an endless possibility of diverse options with a plant-based diet. And when people can realize that, and especially, you know, with the work you do, incorporating it into their children's diet and children's habits and learned flavors that they love, I think it can be a really rewarding and not restrictive at all um, for the options for their meals. Yeah, absolutely. There is 50,000 edible plants in this world, 50,000. And on average, we consume products from about eight different animals. Some people are way less than that because, you know, there are some people yeah. that are eating lamb and goat and, you know, some of these things that other people don't eat. Mm -hmm. So, like, you're right. In general, most people are eating, like, three to four different animals. But it's so, like, it's, like, just a different way to think about it. You can eat eight animals or you can eat 50,000 plants, <laughs> you know? Right. So the choice is a very is dramatic, yours, yeah. it's a very big dramatic difference in choice. Yeah. Okay, since you brought up that green goddess pasta, which sounds amazing, I Thank noticed you. that you do have a lot of kale in this uh, cookbook, which yeah. I'm for because I love kale. So there's gotta be a story behind this uh, love of kale. Tell me about it. Yeah, you know, and it's, I'll share a funny story as well. Um, but I just, I remember, I vividly remember the first time I had like a, a kale salad that was just blow your mind good. And I was at this um, coffee shop here in Des Moines downtown. And I'm like, why does it taste so good? It's so tender. It's almost like they've blanched it or something. Like, what did they do? And so I went home and I'm like researching and like they massaged it. So I started massaging kale and making all these different bowls. I, I mean, kale, first of all, it's one of the most nutrient dense foods on earth, as you know, it's an incredible immune booster, supports bone health, prevents a bunch of different diseases and really the fiber in it, it just improves your digestion so much. It's if people are ever wanting to, you know, help with weight management or filling up, I'm like, fill half your plate for lunch and dinner with massage kale or greens of some sort. It's high volume low calorie so it's going to fill you up with lots of nutrients and fullness but not weigh you down not make you tired um but i just fell in love with it i started adding it to 
every or many of the meals I was making. If you just, I mean, whether it was pasta or a stir fry or a curry, a bed of massage kale just adds freshness and fiber and deliciousness. Um, and it was one of those things where people would kind of turn their nose up at it. Like they would just kind of laugh at me and be like, you can't possibly love the taste of kale. I'm like, come over to my house for dinner, going to serve massage kale. And I mean, even my uncle who never eats anything green ever <laughs> loves massage kale now. And it's just, it's so delicious. Um, the funny story I wanted to share. So my husband also fell in love with it and he's a pretty diverse eater. Um, he'll try anything. And it's been, it was actually his idea to go vegan. Um, but he was like, you know what? I am so obsessed with this massage kale. It's like, everyone needs to try this. It's so delicious. It makes every single recipe have more flavor and taste better. Um, and I was like, well, why don't we try eating massage kale for at least one meal every single day for 30 days? So we had the month of kale. And it was, I mean, we didn't just eat kale, but we'd have it, you know, with roasted cauliflower or pasta or curry, you know, all the different dishes I was mentioning, but every single night for 30 days. And it was funny because, you know, the first two, couple of weeks, he's like, this is great. And the third week, he's like, I'm still going strong. I still love it. And I think it was literally like day 29 that he's like, I'm done. I cannot have any more kale. <laughs> He, he raised his limit. He <laughs> left the house in the middle of dinner and like drove to get French fries. He's like, I just needed like not kale. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so maybe, maybe not 30 days straight of massage kale, but you know, a lot is good. <laughs> yeah. You can make it quite a long time with massage kale. <laughs> yeah. It was funny. Um, but I agree. I'm a food for life instructor. And one of the things we teach in one of our classes is how to massage kale and, mm -hmm. you know, help make it tender. Cause I think that's the problem is sometimes people think of kale and they think of it as like, cause it is, it's thicker, it's a thicker leaf mm -hmm. and it's tougher. And they just think of like, ugh, I'm just eating grass and it has no flavor. But you know, this is what I tell people all the time. Nobody eats just plain meat. Nobody eats, right. you know, any plain food in general, unless it's just fruit, you know? Yeah. So treat your veggies, treat your starches, treat your beans, your tofu the same way. You got to season it. You got to make some sort of, you know, either lemon dressing or, you know, mm -hmm. I love the cashew. I love creamy dressings are my favorite, but Me too. you know, those things. And then you're going to start acquiring that flavor because the flavors yeah. are going to contrast. So it's not just going to be this bitter, chewy, disgusting thing. It's going to be like, wow, that really brings the flavor out. And now I love that texture. Add in some pumpkin seeds. I mean, yep. it's amazing. Possibilities so, are endless. Yes. Well, I want to go back a little bit because you actually never mentioned in your journey how you even started doing blogging. Um, so oh, yeah. w where did that come about? And um, have you always been like a good cook or is that only a recent thing? That is a great piece of my journey that I totally left out. So thank you for circling back. Um, I have always loved cooking. My parents, both of them are fabulous in the kitchen. They actually owned a catering company when I was a kid. So i um, very familiar with the food service industry. My mom is a phenomenal baker. My dad just, I mean, great cook. They're always making, when I was growing up, it, we never had processed food. It was always homemade pasta sauce, homemade pasta, um, always a big salad every night. Just everything was fresh. And even if there was, you know, animal proteins and dairy and stuff in it, it was always um, homemade in a lot of thought and intention put into what they were doing with just a natural skill. So mm -hmm. I grew up in the kitchen with them a ton. That was very helpful. Um, probably, I mean, I've always loved to cook, but the reason I started this was actually kind of for um, a self-serving reason. I was always making up recipes and it would be one of those things where a month would go by and my husband Clinton would say, hey, will you make that, you know, XYZ that you made a month ago? And I'm like, Ugh. I have no idea what I did. So, <laughs> and I, I also liked the food photography aspect. Um, I was super artistic growing up. And then my first career was actually as a hair colorist. So the oh. um, styling of food and the, the colors and the different artistic aspect came naturally to me. So I started my Instagram just, I would snap a picture of the dish and I would write the caption with the recipe. And it was almost like a personal archive of my recipes for me. 
um, and those around me that had been to my house for dinner and wanted them and, you know, so be it. But um, COVID happened. I started my blog July of 2019. COVID, obviously we all know, came March of 2020. And we were stuck at home. And I'm not a big TV watcher. I didn't have a book I was super hooked on at that time. And um, I poured all of my time, I mean, hours every day into growing my Instagram presence, recipe development, recipe testing, upping my food photography skills, which have come a long way. If you really want to dive <laughs> into the archives, the original photos are still up there. But um, yeah, and it just, I mean, I think when COVID hit, I had like 800 followers and now I think I have 95,000. So in just a few years, it's been a pretty um, fun growth. And a lot of that was due to the focus and effort I put in at the beginning of the pandemic. Wow, that's amazing. That's intentionality right there. That's a, a, an example of what happens when you become consistent and set your mind to something. That's really cool. Yeah. Thank but you. But that's also neat that you grew up with the influence of eating food that you make yourself and make it home mm -hmm. and deliberate about that because not everybody and a lot of people don't have that experience because we're so busy and people don't have the confidence in the kitchen. I have uh, families who eat out almost every single meal. So there's definitely those people that they just, they don't have any confidence. They don't know how to do it. They're afraid they're gonna mess up. So they're just like, okay, I'm just gonna order out yeah. every single time. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's really what a gift to have that. All right, awesome. I wanna switch gears because one thing I've noticed or gathered from uh, reading the description in your book that you had about yourself and looking at your blog is it seems to me that you live your life with an abundance mindset. So you could tell me if you agree or you disagree on that, but if so, can you tell us more about that and how we can all create that in our own lives? I, so I guess what I would say is an abundance of gratitude, an abundance of positivity, an abundance of drive and discipline, yes. Um, and I truly believe that, you know, what you put out there comes back, what you water will grow and where you put your energy and your time, whether it's the people around you, whether it's a project you're working on, whether it's your fitness and your health, what you focus on and the energy you put out there 100% impacts what you get in return. So, it, you know, it's funny, my, um, friends and family often tell me I'm have toxic positivity because I'm just, I'm not even a glass half full person. I'm like a glass all the way full person. <laughs> like, even if it's, you know, just a dire looking outcome. And it's not like I lack realistic views. I just, you know, I truly believe if you put positive energy out there and you do the best you can, it's, it's going to come back. And, um, I think nine times out of 10, it typically works for me. And I just, living with positivity and happiness and gratitude and intention. Um, you know, when I, when I wake up in the morning, it's like, hey, I'm excited to wake up. I cannot wait to work out. I'm so grateful my body has the ability to work out. I'm so grateful that the workouts and the food I consume enable me to look and feel my best and enable me to have this life and career. And yeah, is that kind of what you were yeah, meaning by no. abundance mindset? No, that's beautiful. And I guess I was also referring to like all the travel that you do and how you like visiting different places and all of that. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. We, my husband and I both absolutely share a love for travel and um, we've always enjoyed traveling. We actually, we got engaged in Southern France. We got married in Southern France with a small group of friends and family. Um, we, we just, we love other countries and cities and cultures. Um, so that's always been a big part of our lives. I think it's also a great place for foodies to travel and spend their time and efforts and investments in exploring the world and different wines and cultures and cuisines. Mm -hmm. um, but we really, uh, we, we lost our 15 year old golden retriever um, January of 2021, which was very, very hard for us. and we started traveling a ton kind of just to take our minds off of it. It was just a way to fill our cup and we don't have kids yet. So it was um, a really fulfilling way to kind of just 
inject immediate happiness and uh, distraction. And just through that, we've made friends all over the globe. We've found new cuisines and wines that we love. And just, um, yeah, I think, you know, a life not traveled is not well spent. Yeah. Well, and I imagine you get so much inspiration from trying different foods in the actual cultures that they originated yeah. from because there's always a little bit of a difference, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. My, actually, I have a, a dream. Um, I, sh I guess I shouldn't spill the beans, but <laughs> I would love someday to write a book kind of um, about that. That's what I'll say for now. <laughs> I love it. That's great. I love I love when people share their dreams because I think it inspires other people to even yeah. have dreams. There's some people that are afraid to even have dreams. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Well, what do you wish more people knew? I wish more people knew how delicious vegan food was, that there's other ways of cooking and eating, and that you can get enough protein and all the nutrients you need on a diversified plant-based diet. It's, it's so, it's not even, I don't know about you, but it's not even something I think about. Like I don't track my protein every day. It's so easy. Yes. It's just like, I agree. <laughs> and there's, you know, I had a friend once she went vegan. She's like, I just was so lightheaded. I'm like, well, what were you eating? She's like, well, I would have, you know, um, a smoothie, like just blended blueberries and, milk for breakfast and then i would have celery sticks with a little hummus for lunch and then like a, a mixed green salad for dinner i'm like oh okay let's have a conversation we would all so, be lightheaded on that diet <laughs> yeah, no kidding but she was just she didn't really know where to begin as far as like having a diverse she's like i'm eating real foods i'm eating vegetables and fruits and just keeping it clean isn't that what i'm supposed to do and i'm like well yes but no you need more sustenance you need whole grains, you need legumes, you need, I mean, if you can, if your body allows tofu, like I, I eat so much tofu. It is probably one of my favorite foods and just, um, yeah. So I guess kind of got off track there, but I wish people knew how amazing they could feel on a plant-based diet. And I, I truly believe, you know, we're such a society that, you know, out of sight, out of mind, or I don't want to see that. If I, if I don't see it, I can do it as far as I think that the majority of people, if they had to go out and slaughter animals or pick their meat up from the slaughterhouse and see what was happening, I don't think that as many people out there would be eating meat. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And if they were aware of the impact that, you know, mass industrial production of livestock was having, I don't think they would support it as much as they do either. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that is why some of these large animal agriculture operations do everything they can to hide the truth from the mm -hmm. public and why it's like illegal and why people get sent to jail if they try to expose it, you know, yeah. because it would be a big threat. Because, yeah, right. once, that, once that picks up and, you know, our you know, beliefs change as a society, it is, it is going to have a big impact on the meat industry. So yeah, it's great. Well, Jackie, this has been a fantastic conversation. If you could please let us know where listeners can connect with you, where they can buy your book, if there's any other products or services you offer, we'd love to know. Absolutely. Thank you. And I have enjoyed the conversation so much as well. Um, my, the majority of my content I share daily on Instagram. My handle is Jack Fruitful Kitchen. I also have a website, it's jackfruitful.com. Printable recipes are on there. And that is also where, so if you are someone that's new to plant-based eating or if you have a busy lifestyle or if you just want to refresh on meal prepping but you don't want to spend three hours every Sunday meal prepping, I have two different four-week meal plans available on my website. Um, they have every single meal for breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, dessert, and even a fun mocktail um, and brunch on the weekends. It's a whole four weeks, so two separate months of them, um, and it actually focuses on reducing food waste. So every single ingredient you're buying each week you're using all of, um, that's a really, really foolproof way, an affordable way for people to get started on a clean plant-based diet. Um, and then my book is available pretty much anywhere um, books are sold, looks like this. 
and you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, many local bookstores are carrying it, which I love to see it on local shelves. And yeah, that is what I have to offer. And for people that, if your local bookstore doesn't have it, just request it. They usually can get it yes. in within a couple of days. So, all Absolutely. right, that's fantastic. Okay, last question. Leave us with your top three tips for planning vegan meals that are also efficient, affordable, and reduce food waste. Buy my meal plan, number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, not kidding, but it will 100% solve all of that. But the core of it is really this, like number one, choose plan recipes for your week that use similar ingredients. I mean, rarely are you going to use an entire bunch of green onions in one recipe. So plan two different recipes for both and utilize leftovers. So if you're making pasta on Sunday night, there's only two of you, make four servings anyway. Put half of it away right away once it's cooled. But that way you have your healthy lunch ready to go the next day or you have your Tuesday night dinner plan for when your kids have soccer and you're going to be in a rush, whatever that may be. Um, I think strategic leftover planning and a little bit of prepping is great. I also think that um, kind of doing batch prepping. So let's say you roast a bunch of sweet potatoes, you make a big batch of quinoa, and you grill a whole thing of tofu. And you have that in your fridge for the week and maybe one night or one day for lunch, you take a few of those things and you add it to a bowl of kale. The next day, maybe you mix it into your pasta. The next day, maybe you're mixing it you know, with the quinoa and a dressing and some chickpeas, um, kind of prepping just a few things like a vegetable, um, a carb or a protein and a green can make easy and affordable, super nutrient rich bowls, very effortless. Yeah, I love that. Those are great. Was tips. that three? <laughs> I, I think that was more than three, actually. Okay. So you went above and beyond. Okay. Jackie, thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio and sharing with us your story and all of these great tips. And I hope people, especially if they're looking for more whole foods recipes and are starting on their journey or have been eating plant-based for a while but looking for another fantastic cookbook, will go out and get your cookbook. And I'm really grateful for everything that you do and shining your light and joy. So thank you so much. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you, and the feeling is so mutual. You as well. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here, and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening, and have a plantastic day.